stereotypes. Hi, um, I'm a computer science researcher and today I'm going to talk about an ongoing research project where we try to verify concurrent Go programs using an approach called behavioral types. I know the title of my talk is a bit cryptic, but I hope at the end of the talk you have a vague understanding of what is behavioral types and how we can use them to understand concurrency in Go and other programming languages. So let's first take a look at Go. Go is well known for its built-in support for concurrency. Do not communicate by sharing memory. Instead, share memory by communicating. So Go takes a very unique approach to concurrency in that it um, encourages the use of message passing rather than the more traditional shared memory and locking style of concurrency. So in Go, we have Go routines, which are efficient, lightweight threads where we can easily spawn to do different tasks concurrently. And then we have channels, which are simple but expressive primitives for synchronization um, between the Go routines by message passing. So the concurrency model and the concurrency primitives in Go is resoundingly simple. And with just a few lines of code, you can already get a concurrent program up and running. But here's the question for you. Does having simple concurrency primitives make using concurrency easier? And I think the answer is no. Because having simple concurrency primitives doesn't really hide the inherent complexities and pitfalls that you can, have, you can find in concurrency. And if anything, adding concurrency to your program can open up your program to a completely different class of bugs that's not usually found in any sequential program. So for instance, you can have data races where you have multiple Go routines trying to access the same shared variable. And if you access it in a wrong way, then you lead to the program in an inconsistent state. Or if you use mutex to protect your shared variable, well, if you lock and unlock your mutex in the wrong way, then you can also easily get into mutex deadlocks. But today in this talk, I wanted to focus on the message passing style of concurrency and also the kinds of concurrency problems that can come with it, such as communication deadlocks. So what do I mean by communication deadlocks and what can we do about them? Well, let's look at an example. So let's suppose two gophers try to send each other a message. We know that gophers are really simple creatures. They can't multitask, so they cannot speak and listen at the same time. So in order for one gopher to pass on a message to another gopher, the gopher will only speak if the other side is ready to listen. What if both the gophers are really impatient and they both wanted to speak before they listen? Well, then we kind of have a problem because neither of them can speak and both gophers will be stuck waiting for each other to listen. But we know that they're not going to listen. They both want to speak first. And this is a textbook example of a communication deadlock. And we've, if we try to implement this as a, as a program, then this may be what we get. Um, so first of all, we have uh, two gophers spawn as go routines. And each of the gophers start by saying hey to the speak channel. And then they try to receive a message from the listen channel. So they try to speak first before they listen. And if we try to run this program, What we get is fatal error, all go routines are sleep deadlock. So the very fact that we know that this program has a deadlock and is reported in the, in the uh, output is because of the Go's runtime deadlock detector. So it works by looking at all the current um, go routines in the program and see if any of them are still running. So if none of the go routines are running, then of course there's a deadlock and the program cannot continue. Okay, so there's a deadlock in this program, and let's say I, I didn't know about it, and I just added a completely new uh, Go routine to the program. So what I'm doing here is I'm not really fixing the deadlock, but I'm adding something uh, extra to, to the program. So the deadlock is still there, I'm just, I'm just adding something extra. So, so the deadlock is still there, the deadlock detector should be able to detect that as well. 
but we try to run this program, we expect a message saying there is a deadlock, but actually there's no such message. And it's because of how, this is because of how the runtime deadlock detector works. Because when, when a runtime deadlock detector comes around and check if there's any running Go routines, there is at least one Go routine. So make coffee is a completely separate Go routine. And it comes around, sees that make coffee is having some progress. So obviously, there's no deadlock, even though the other two Go routines are completely stuck. So this is sometimes we call it a partial deadlock. So if the program has a deadlock, but only some of the Go routines are active, then, then this is um, what we call a partial deadlock. And so in short, the runtime deadlock detector is not very robust. And so don't rely on it to detect all your deadlock problems. But it turns out that deadlock detection is a much harder problem than it seems. So for, for instance, if you, have any, for, if you have any concurrent problems, uh, if, you if you try to run a concurrent program, then all the interleave executions may run in a completely different order. And so maybe you find that that law only happens sometimes. So it's really hard to track down in debug. And the more problematic um, cases is when you have a program that doesn't output for a very long time. You can't really tell between Having, having the program having a deadlock or whether it's just a really genuine long-running program. So, so there's no way of telling whether or not there's a deadlock if the deadlock detector is not able to tell you that. So we looked into solutions and see if there's any other, other solutions already in academic research. Well, and luckily, deadlock detection is an important topic in, in concurrency research. But most of the practical works in deadlock detection focuses on shared memory and locks. And that's obvious because most of the mainstream programming languages uses the shared memory approach to concurrency, like Java or the new C++ 11. And as for the message parsing style of concurrency, most of the works that works with deadlock detection are limited to theoretical works. And also, other than Erlang, which uses the actor model, there's not a lot of active and native uh, concurrent programming languages out there for people to test on. So if we look at, we look at the research papers um, on Go, um, which can be found in the Golang GitHub um, wiki, you see that even though there are a lot of papers that use Go, there are only very few, it's about Go itself. So a lot of the papers are using Go to implement some maybe new kind of digital systems or maybe even analyzing DNA sequences, but just very few are about Go on the language itself. So it is our research aim to apply the theoretical advances in concurrency to Go so that we can better understand the concurrency in Go and use that understanding to try to detect concurrency problems such as deadlocks. So to do that, we first need to know the core reason for, for the deadlocks and the concurrency problems. So channel operations like send and receive they block the Go routines when a channel is not ready for it. So that doesn't mean that the channel cannot be used. If you have a separate Go routine that uses the same channel, and you can put the value in the channel, and you can still use the, use the channel as you, you have before. But the main problem is when a channel operation blocks, and there's no chance of unblocking that channel, then you get a deadlock. So one example is when you just create a channel, and then immediately try to receive a value from that channel. Since there's nothing to receive in a channel, this Go routine blocks. And because this is the only Go routine that is currently running in, in the program, then so we have a deadlock. Similar things applies to buffer channel as well. So let's say I create a buffer channel with a capacity of one. So if we put one element into this channel, it will still be fine because the channel can hold the, hold the um, value and it will still be able to continue. But if we put more than the capacity of the channel, then we won't be able to continue. So the channel will block because there's no more buffer space in the, new, in the channel. And so the Go routine blocks. And then we get a deadlock as well. But one obvious observation is that it doesn't matter what values are being sent or received at the channel. 
it's the actual behavior, the operation of sending and receiving them that directly causes that lock to happen. And so we, if we want to model these kinds of problems, then we need to turn to a real concurrency model. So we turn to what's called process calculi in the literature. So process calculi is a family of models for concurrent processes. And quite remarkably, two of the most famous uh, British computer scientists who's been awarded Turing Award has both worked on process calculi. So first, we have um, Sir Tony Hall, who worked on CSP, uh, communicating sequential processes in 1970s. And then we have Professor Robin Milner, who worked more on the concurrency side of things, so that he developed CCS, Calculus of Communicating Systems, and Pi Calculus. What's important about process calculi, as you can already tell, if you recognize the name CSP, CSP is also the original inspiration of the GOES concurrency model. So it's almost natural that we use this process calculi model to model the concurrency in Go. And what process calculi is, it's basically formal models of concurrency. So it's very mathematical, and it models how concurrent processes communicate with each other. So in, in Go, th this will be called Go routines, and the communication will be sending and receiving. And so this, is, uh, this figure is one instance of uh, a process, process calculi, and this one is called a, a asynchronous pi calculus. This is the complete syntax of the calculus, so it's really, really simple. But as you can see, it's got all the components that make up the concurrency features of Go as well. So you can you have parallel composition, which kind of equivalent to spawning a Go routine. You can create channels, you can receive, you can send, and you can even have loops to keep doing the communication. And we build on top of this foundation to, and we introduce what's called behavioral types. So behavioral types is an abstract model of a Go program, which only consists of its concurrent behavior. So we build on the foundations of process calculi as types. So because we, it's abstract, because we don't, we don't really care about the data values that are being sent or received. We only care about that the operations are, are there in the, in the behavioral types. But we wanted to preserve the shape of the program, so we keep the control flow structure of your, of your program into, into your, the behavioral types. And by behaviors, of course, I mean it's the message passing communication between the Go routines. So here is a, here on the left hand side is a uh, very simple concurrent Go program, and we'll see this again later in, uh, in the demo. So we create a channel, we spawn something, and then later on, we receive uh, some value from that channel. And then in a Go routine, we do some printing, but then we send a, send a value to the channel, and then we finish. And if you look at the right-hand side, which is the equivalent in a behavioral type, you almost have the completely same thing. So you can create a new channel, you can spawn, you can receive. But the biggest difference here is we're not talking about the actual values that are being sent or received. So here in sending, we're only saying we send to this channel that is passed on by in the, in the argument of the, of the function. It can be any number. It can be 1, it can be 2, it can be 42, and even a arithmetic expression. It, it doesn't really matter because what we care about is just the behavior, the operations that, that is in the, in the communication. So based on behavioral types, and I present you a framework for deadlock detection. So this is a work, joint work with my colleagues at Imperial, and there are two steps to it. First of all, we wanted to extract the behavioral type model from Go source code. And we, use, we extract the model by using static analysis, and we use the SSA package in the Go Extra Tools. Um, which is, as I say, if you're not familiar with the word, it's, it's a, single, a static single assignment. And it's also used by Guru. If anyone's uh, used Guru before, then, then you, you know this tool is very powerful. It's, it's able to tell you many things about, about uh, a Go program. And we use SSA to analyze the Go program pre and use the semantics of the Go program to generate 
uh, a behavior type model called Migo. And it's, we give it a name because it's tailored specifically to Go. And we support um, buffer channels and closed channels. Um, for Closed channel is a very Go-specific primitive. It's not found in most other concurrency um, languages or models. So, so we have to tailor especially for, uh, for, for Go. So we take the Go source code, we convert it into uh, SSA form, and then we extract the behavior type model as, as a model. And the second step is to use a model checker to check for the properties in, in our model. So model checkers are specialized um, tools for analyzing um, very big models. And generally, so in our case, we convert the, the behavioral type model into an LT, uh, LTS uh, label transition system. But it's generally, you can think of it as a graph of all the possible executions of a program. And in, in this case, the possible execution of the types. So, and then we, we put into the model, the model itself, and then the formula, which describes some properties of the graph. So the properties of the graph are usually expressed in a kind of logic statement. And, but one example of, you know, if we want to say, if we want to ask the, the model whether this model has a deadlock, we can ask the model checker, well, can this program always get to the end of all the states? So can this program always get to the end of the, the program to finish the program without getting stuck or without getting deadlocked? So if it gets stuck, then there is a deadlock. So, and then the model checker will be able to tell us yes or no, Maybe sometimes it will take a very long time, but it will eventually give us an answer. So now I'm going to do a very quick demo to show you what we've got. So here is, a, here is the example we've seen just now on the slides. So we create a channel, spawn go routine, send and receive. So very simple. And you also get what you would expect, um, the answer. Can, can anyone see here clearly at the back? Yeah. Okay. So, so here you have the you have the result of the of the message, and, and you just print out the result, right? So this is a working working program. And so now we're going to extract the behavioral type model of, of this program. So so what we get here at the bottom is the behavioral type of this program, as what we've seen just now on the slides as well. So. As you can already see, even from very far away, that the structure of the behave type and the program is very similar. And what it's missing is the function calls or the things that are not related to communication. So we only preserve everything related to communication. So again, again, the values are, are not there because we only have a sending to a channel. That's the operation that we're interested in. And then if we give this to the model checker, the model checker can give us a lot of uh, details about, about this, this program. So you can ignore the first two lines. I think maybe it's better I zoom it in. So one of the things that it tells us is um, this program has no global deadlock. So this program will not get stuck. As we see, we, we run the program. And we also won't get partial deadlock because if there's no global deadlock, then partial deadlock won't, won't happen as well. So the other two, the other two properties that uh, I'm gonna, I will show you in uh, the next demo. So remember the program in the very beginning of the talk where we have two very impatient gophers which deadlocks uh, when, you, when they try to communicate each, with each other? So this is the same program. We, we still have the deadlocks. And, and uh, now you can also see uh, what make coffee does. It doesn't do anything. So we infer the types from, from the program. And as you can see, even though the program is quite big, um, the, the actual inferred program is, uh, the inferred type is very, very, very small. And if we ask the model checker, uh, you know, tell us about this program then now we know that, okay, there is a global deadlock in this program, and, and which also leads to a, a, a partial, partial deadlock. So what about, what about that thing I, I made to, to make the deadlock detector not work? So we can add this new uh, go routine again to make a coffee, 
And, and as you can see, as before, the go routine, the deadlock data doesn't come up to say there's a deadlock, so it doesn't really work properly. And if we infer the type and then ask the model checker again, then okay, well, it doesn't really affect the, the, the new go routine that we're adding doesn't really affect the results of the, of the um, analysis. So we're still able to see that there is a global deadlock, there's a partial deadlock. So, okay, so, so, so far I've shown you, you know, when programs don't work. What if I fix this impatient gophers and convert one of the gophers into a patient gopher? So, so we have the original gopher, which speaks and then, and then listen. And then I have a patient gopher, which listens first and then speak. So this time around, there shouldn't be any problems. So we can run this program and yep, it works as expected. And if we extract the model, so now, now as you can see, there is an extra, extra function here, which is the patient gopher, which, which receives and then, and then speak. Now the model checker should tell us that now this program has no global deadlock or partial deadlock. And so, so we're, we're good. Just in case you don't trust me, I can add this uh, extra go routine in again, and then analyze it again. And the model checker will still tell us the same answer. So it doesn't matter if the, if the go routine has no communication, it doesn't affect the dialogue detection. So I said I'm gonna show you the other two properties that we analyze in, in a program. So one of them is um, what we call channel safety. So some of you may know that if you have a channel and you close the channel twice, you get a panic. So here is a, here is a program which does exactly that. Um, I create a channel, I spawn a go routine, I send something to that channel and then I say, okay, I'm finished with this channel. And actually I received the, I received the value from, from the channel and then I close the, close the channel again. So if we try to run this program, I think we should get a panic. So a panic close of a closed channel. So this is bad, we don't want this to happen. So let's use our model to analyze the program again. We analyze the program, we ask the model checker, tell us about the program, and it will tell us that, okay, channel safety is now false. So which means that the, you, you, this program will have a, have a problem with, with closing channels. Okay. So you can detect multiple uses of close. So if I comment this out, it should say it's fine. So this program works as expected and we model check it again. And now, now channel safety is fixed. We also know that, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we also know that even though you can close a channel, uh, you can still receive from a closed channel. So, but you cannot, of course, you cannot send any more things to the channel. So we can, we can try this both as well. So I close the channel, let's bring, so the channel is now closed here and I can receive a channel, but if I try to send something on this already closed channel, Thing there will be a problem again. You know, you cannot send on a closed channel, and this this channel safety property also covers this as well. And yes, it worked. <laughs> and and you can you can keep on you can keep on uh, receiving even though, and there's no problem. We check it, and we yeah, that works. So the last of the properties that, that I want to show you is uh, called eventual reception. So this is the problem when, when you, you have a buffer channel, you put something into the channel, so maybe it's some um, in-flight data that you point, want to pull it out at some point, but then maybe you have a bug in your code, you'd forgotten to take that thing out of that channel, so can we, find out whether or not the, the channel will have something still inside them when the program finishes. Well, 
so it doesn't really cause an, cause an error, but it will be a very hard bug to detect because you don't know whether or not you have uh, re um, received something out from a, from a buffer channel. So here I have a program which creates a channel and then puts a value into the channel, but I didn't take it out, so I just let the program finish. As I said, it doesn't it, does, it isn't really an error in, in, the, in the concurrency, but it is a property that we really wanted to, to know about. And so we, again, infer the type, and then we model check it. Now it tells us that uh, eventual reception is false. So the, the messages that you put into at least one of the channels are not always taken out of the channel. So, well, to, to fix it, we can just easily you know, take the value out of the channel. And again, it doesn't, affect, it doesn't affect the running of the program, but it's a property that we're interested in. And we ask the model checker, yep, eventual reception is now, uh, is a property now satisfied by this program. Um, so just before I wrap up the demo, I wanted to use a uh, example to just demonstrate why concurrency is really difficult and why having this kind of tool will be very useful for, for developers. So this is a dining philosopher's problem and it's a very classic concurrency problem um, invented originally by uh, Dijkstra, which is uh, a very famous Dutch um, computer scientist. And the, the story goes like this. A group of philosophers went to have dinner together and so they sat at a table. In front of each of them, there is a bowl of spaghetti. And there is a fork on each, everyone's left and right hand side. And they, eat the, they can only eat the uh, bowl of spaghetti if they, have, if they get off both the left hand side fork and the right hand side fork. So, but you know, philosophers act very randomly. So they, they just spend a lot of time thinking and suddenly, they would just pick up the fork. And so we can implement this dining philosopher's problem into, into a Go program. And in, in, in this way. So, so the forks are represented by a by, by channel. So in, in, this, in, this program, in this program I've implemented, we have three philosophers and, and three forks. So you can see that you know, all, the, all the philosophers can't eat uh, the, their, their food at the same time. And if we look at the implementation of the philosophers, they get the parameter left and right channels. And then because they, they act randomly, so we kind of, it's kind of undeterministic. So they can, they can either pick up one fork, so they pick a left-hand side fork, and then later on they use a, we use a select to allow them to pick up another fork. So if they have both fork, they can eat. And after they eat, they put the fork down and you know, let, the, let the program continue. But so the difficulty in this problem is that there are, the story is not very complicated to, to understand, but then there are already a lot of moving parts. So each of the fork, it's a, it's a good routine. Each of the philosopher is a good routine. There are selects, which are non-deterministic, so you can't predict how it's going to execute a program. And if you're not careful, then you can get in your deadlock. If every philosopher decided to pick up their right-hand side fork first, then they'll all be starving, they'll all die, so we don't have philosophy anymore. So, so taking, taking what I've uh, written here, and, and if we run this program, you know, you can see, okay, we get that logs. And if I run it a few more times, you see that every time I run, the different philosophers got different forks. So it's completely unpredictable how, how this is going to play out. And this is really the, the core of why concurrency is, is complicated, even for such a small program. So again, we, we apply our, our analysis to analyze this program of uh, dining philosophers and I hope you can see clearly it says there's a global dialogue in this program which is what we expected that's that's what we've seen 
So, okay, so, so how can we fix it? Well, one of the solutions for the dining philosopher's problem is that if I pick up a fork and I cannot get the other fork straight away, then I put down the fork I currently have. Then someone else, you know, I'll try again later until someone else um, released the, the, both of the forks and then I can eat. So this is one of the solutions. There are multiple solutions to this problem. And so, so to do that, I, I changed the, both of the philosophers to use a default. So that means if I pick up the, uh, one of the forks and I'm, I'm supposed to pick up this other fork, but it's not available, then I'll, I'll, do the, I'll, pick the, I'll use the default branch to put down the fork I currently have. So I think if I run it, it will just, it won't have any deadlock, so it will just be philosophers eating. It's not very interesting. And if I, analyze, if I analyze the program again, this time it should have no deadlocks because we've seen that you know, even if you run it a few times, it will still not have uh, any, any deadlocks. And our analysis tells us that, yep, we, it confirms that this program will not have global debt or, de uh, or partial deadlocks. And going back to the slides, so I've obviously omitted a lot of technical details about how about the framework, like uh, how we actually do the analysis. It does a context-sensitive analysis to extract the types. Um, there are a lot of practical considerations because uh, theory and practice is not quite the same, um, like con uh, like considering new channels and data structures and so on. It's also a termination check button that I haven't pressed, and if you're interested, we can talk after, after the, the talk. And, but just to conclude uh, uh, my talk, um, concurrency primitives in Go are really, really simple, but they, they alone don't make concurrency easy. So I've shown you behavioral types, which is a very powerful abstraction to reason about concurrency in Go. And we've shown that how we can use behavioral types on, on Go to detect deadlocks among other different um, concurrency problems. Well, we believe that someday it will be an important utility for any Go developers who want to develop concurrent Go programs. And I hope you feel that you've learned something today. And thank you very much for your attention. If you're interested in uh, more of our research, um, there's some further reading you can, you can do. Um, but thank you very much for coming. Is there any questions? Oh. <laughs> Hi, uh, great talk. Thanks. When can we use it? <laughs> well, we, we're still preparing a paper and we'll be finishing up pretty soon. Let's say in a month's time, we'll release it in open source and, and we'll let everyone know uh, when we release it. Excellent, thanks. <laughs>
So uh, <clears throat> there's a small number of paradigms of communication patterns that are guaranteed deadlock free. Um, would it be possible, for, uh, sorry, for example, the client server paradigm? Mm -hmm. If you've got an acyclic graph, it's, it's deadlock free. Mm -hmm. um, so would it be possible to short circuit your, um, your model calculation on a big model if you can recognize um, patterns or would that not be an issue? I don't see the reason why not. Uh, I think it would be possible. Um, I, can, I can look into that and we can talk, talk afterwards. Really good presentation, thank you. Um, just, I'm curious, uh, are you guys in contact with the Go developer community into potentially getting something out there into the official tooling, for example, or something like that? Um, not at the moment. I, I don't think it's quite as ready as, as we wanted it to be. Um, maybe, maybe a few more iterations, when, when, then we can start talking to them. Um, but, but we do want to collaborate with Google if, if they're interested in, in, the, in the tool chain. Thank you. Um, have you tried it with really big models? Um, yes and no. Uh, so there are there are certain limitations that I, I didn't really mention in in the in the talk, and I think they can be solved. So, so for for. Pretty much any static analysis uh, approach to, to analyzing programs, there are limitations on how much runtime things you can, you can infer from, from a program. So if you, let's say, uh, have the user to input a number and put it, use it as a, a channel buffer size, then, then obviously you, you, you wouldn't be able to, to analyze it statically to, to guarantee that this is, this is uh, going to be safe for any number of, of a buffer size. And so we, we, try, we will try to address this uh, after we finish our, our current implementation. And th th there are a lot of things that, that we wanted to do, but we, we still can't. But no, I, was, I was thinking more about like when you've got like, you know, I don't know, so do, a, do, a, do a, an example with like 65,000 channels and what sort of runtime, you know, you've got a lot of interactions. Does it, is it, is it an exponential? Runtime in solving, or I, I think I think it would be it would be all right yeah. to solve. So, so okay, cool. the most of the most of the Go programs that that we've uh, looked at um, have maybe even if for for a very large code base, they they usually have only a limited number of um, concurrency because you don't want to you usually don't want to overuse your your concurrency stuff, and one of the more complex one is the, it's actually the dining philosopher's pro problem because you can easily get into a, a lot of states of interleaving between you know multiple multiple philosophers and so far so far uh, the model check has been able to handle it quite well so I would imagine if we can get a model out of any bigger programs we can test it on a model checker but I don't think it will be too slow for the model checker to, to check. So, so I just wanted to, to, to um, say. Uh, so previously we had a, we had a implemented something similar, but not with a model checker. And with the dining philosophers problems, um, I think analyzing four dining philosophers took, actually no, three dining philosophers took us uh, 16 minutes. And with the model checker, it took something like five seconds. So it's a huge improvement in in terms of how much more states, how much more complex uh, con concurrency you, you can handle. So I think, I think with, with model checker, it's, it's certainly possible. Hi, uh, so it, for some of these properties, it gives you like true or false yep. outputs. Um, I was wondering if it also like gives you maybe or gives up or like, when it gives you yes or no, are they like, are there false negatives or positives? So um, in, in, in a really bad cases, it will time out. It will take just, just take too long for, for, for them to calculate the model, maybe take a few days for, for, to do that. Um, but I think eventually it will, it will tell us yes or no. And sorry, what was the other question? Uh, I was wondering about like false negatives and positives, like how to think about 
whether like true means yes, definitely, or? Well, for now, it for now, it's very much depends on um, how much of the model we can directly extract from the model. So, right. so for, for now, we're very conservative with, with the extraction. So we only extract the model as it is if it's exactly like that written in, in the source code. So we don't use any heuristics to say, okay, if it takes n channels, then let's just say n is one. We, we, we don't do this kind of uh, approximation. So I think there shouldn't be, be well, f false positive as long as we can extract the model for, for, for these cases. But once we start venturing into getting, looking at the heuristics and trying to you know, approximate the model, then, then false positive is much more likely to, to, to happen than, than it currently is. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the talk, it's really interesting. Um, I'm interested in the, the language of these formulae. Right. Um, so can you give us an idea of what the, for example, what does the formula look like that expresses this program has no global deadlocks? Um, um, I can give you a keyword, you can, you can, you can look it up. It's a modal, modal mu formula. It's a it's a very it's a very theoretical um, for, for formalization of of a modal logic. Okay, I'd like that <laughs> pointer. Cheers. <laughs> Um, how do you plan to deal with runtime run input that changes the program behavior in ways that change um, the concurrency behavior that may affect? Uh, so for instance, depending on the evaluation of a condition, you might close the channel for the second time or not. Okay, well, that's another thing I haven't touched on. Uh, so in, in behavioral types, we, we say we preserve the control flow of the program. So to us, um, if you um, close a channel, if, if, uh, if there's a, an, some kind of different errors, it will just be a branch between the normal, the normal path and the you know, exception path. So, so in a model, both of them will be in, in, the, in, the, in the state space, just so to say. And so, yeah, that that will not be that will be covered by the model current model as well. Hi, uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Uh, how did you prove that this doesn't solve the whole team problem? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a proof yet. You should. <laughs> But uh, well, so so the general, um, the the extraction itself, it's uh, generally undecidable. So I think I think we won't be able to solve, solve the general whole thing problem. And but but yeah, we can discuss more afterwards. So you m mentioned the pi calculus at the start of your talk. Uh, yep. Obviously, if if you're sending channels across channels. Yep then the topology of the communication changes. Yep. That, uh, it, I, I'm, is that gonna make your model much harder to calculate? So the, the model that we, uh, the, the kind of calculus we're currently based on is CCS. We don't do channel passing yet, but as for theoretical work, there are type system that deals with, um, um, deals with typing for, for pi calculus, which covers these cases of uh, mobility, or if you're familiar with, with pi calculus. And those are really complex uh, type systems, and I am not sure whether or not you can really practically implement them. But they, they do exist, theoretically. And in, in practice, well, we have to see. <laughs> Just a quick follow-up. Uh, so my earlier question was about mm -hmm. Boolean conditions. So how mm -hmm. do you deal with uh, variables that are, say, an integer? What do you mean by that? Like, instead of having a condition, uh, mm -hmm. an if condition, you have, a, say, a while loop. 
So okay. you, you can't really tell statically. You can you don't necessarily know statically how many times it's going to run. Thank you. Y yeah. Yes, I know. Um, so so uh, for for loops, um, I I mentioned termination checks, so it's it's related. But um, generally, for for a loop to if it's an infinite loop, then we, 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 we got it covered because it will be kind of modeled in the in the model kind of naturally. It's just a you know a loop looped inside a, a state machine. And for the more general question about um, loops inside programs, we'll need to talk about termination check. Um, it's very related to um, liveness property of, of, of a program. So so for for instance you can have a you, you can have a loop that causes the program to to have a partial deadlock even though it looks like the program wouldn't because because of the loop conditions and and that's that's related to to uh, termination check we we can talk later hi so uh i imagine there is no overlap uh, between your work and the Golang race detector? Uh, not currently. Um, so the ra race detector is also a runtime runtime too. So it's like the deadlock detector, um, except except for the runtime uh, for for the race detector. I think it's much much better supported and it's more accurate than than the deadlock detector currently is. But there's no overlap. No. Uh, hello. Uh, I've seen similar things done, um, not with behavioral types, but uh, with Petri nets that can be uh, transformed into LTS uh, systems. What made you choose behavioral types above other possibilities to do the same thing? Um, I would say they're mostly equivalent. So, so it's just a. Uh I say just a, just a, just a model model we pick. Uh, I think um, that, that you can obviously also translate the behavioral types into PetriNet models and then use that to be an input for another model checker that uses PetriNet as input. Um, it's, I don't think there will be significant difference. Obviously, you have to adapt or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs>